it's the reason that I go around doing what I'm doing. I retired last June. And I thought retirement meant. <laughs> <laughs> playing golf. Of course, you could still do that as president. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Oregon. In fact, I bought an organ. I was ready to really learn how to play and learning some new languages. But you know, as I started thinking about my children and grandchildren, and I started thinking about all those patients that I've worked so hard on, I said, you can't just go put your feet up and leave them in this morass and let the country just go down the tubes the way it is going down the tubes right now. And all of us can do something about it. You know, I have always had an, an interest in helping people. I remember as a youngster, I used to love to hear stories about medicine, about doctors. And particularly, I enjoy going to church and hearing stories about missionary doctors who seem like the most noble people on earth, traveling all over the world. Great personal sacrifice to bring not only physical but mental and spiritual healing to people. They seemed to me like the most noble people on earth. I decided at age eight that I was going to be a missionary doctor. And that was my dream until I was 13. <laughs> at which time, having grown up in dire poverty, I decided I'd rather be rich. So, at that point, missionary doctor was out. <laughs> And psychiatrist was in. Oh. Now, I didn't know what a psychiatrist, but on TV they seem like rich people. <laughs> they drove Jaguars and had big fancy mansions and the plush offices, and all they had to do was talk to crazy people. Like that. <laughs> it seemed like I was doing that anyway. So I said, this is going to work out really well. <laughs> but you know, um, when I got to medical school, I, I really came to the conclusion that, you know, God gives everybody special gifts and talents. And I started thinking, I said, what are you really, really good at? And I realized I had a lot of eye-hand coordination, the ability to think in three dimensions. I was a very careful person. I never knocked things over and said, oops. Which is a good characteristic for them. <laughs> And I love to dissect things. I put that all together. I said, you'd be a terrific nurse surgeon. And uh, really, that's, that's how I made the decision. I started out as an adult neurosurgeon. And um, I quickly learned that no matter how good an operation you did on those chronic back pain patients, they never got any better until they got their settlement. <laughs> Whereas... Whereas with the kids, with the pediatric patients, you know, what you see is what you get. When they feel good, you know they felt good. When they felt bad, you know they felt bad. And you can operate for 10, 15, 18 hours on a kid. And if you're successful, the reward may be 50, 60, 70 years of life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas with an old geezer, you spend all that time. <laughs> and they're dying five years or something else. <laughs> So, you see, Monica and I, we like to get a big return on our investment. That's how we want our kids. So, so, obviously, I'm kidding. I like oh, old people. Right. I'm one of them now. But the fact of the matter is, we are very concerned about the young people. We are very concerned about the next generation. There was a time in our country where our leaders were concerned about that. Do you realize the last time we had a totally balanced federal budget with no federal debt was during the time of President Andrew Jackson? That's how long it's been. We can do better than that. 17 and a half trillion dollar national debt. Think about that. 
That's, and that's they meant to mind boggling number. <laughs> it would take you 539,000 years to count to 17 trillion one number per second, which you can't even do one number per second because by the time you get to 15 million 517,000, <laughs> you know, I mean, and when you get into even really big numbers, it takes you 10 seconds just to say the number. So, I mean, think about, think about what we are doing to the next generation and not caring about it. And I'll say a little bit more about caring about those behind us in a minute, but I just want to take this moment to say that I am not politically correct. So don't expect... <laughs> But I think political correctness is a scourge on our society. Yeah. It is anti-American. You know? yeah. People came to this country from all parts of the world trying to escape from people who said, you can say this, but you can't say that. Right. You can live here. You can. You got to buy this. You got. Hey, come on, give me a break. That, is that sound like America to you? Yeah. And the problem is, we're allowing it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because we are not standing up to it. Mm -hmm. We are not being vocal. And political correctness is designed to keep you silent yep. yes. mm -hmm. while they change the underlying fabric of this nation. Yeah. And we can't really stand for that. No, we can't. You know? And that's why they hate me so much when I speak out, because I'm not going to be shut up by them. <laughs> So that's, that's their problem when neurosurgeons get into the mix. Because Monica can tell you, you know, we are not afraid of very many things. And, uh, you know, the only bad thing about neurosurgeons is they tend to be fairly pompous. <laughs> but it selects for that kind of person. I mean, it's, it selects for somebody who says, oh yeah, I can cut your head open. And I'll get yeah, you don't get shrinking violence doing that kind of stuff. But the good thing is pediatric neurosurgeons are a little different because, see, they have to deal with children. So they tend to be a little nicer. You know? okay, so this, it's a good thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with Monica. But, I've, I've known Monica for many, many years, and uh, you know she's the real deal. And uh, you know, what you hear is what you're going to get. It's not going to be a lot of stuff. But, but let me get back to the to this whole PC stuff. One of the real goals of the secular progressive movement is to fundamentally change who we are yeah, as Americans. Right. Yeah. Number one rule of Saul Alinsky, yeah. mm -hmm. you make the majority <laughs> believe that what they think is old and outdated and that no intelligent person thinks that way. Mm -hmm. And what you believe is the only thing that enlightened people believe. Mm -hmm. And if you can co-opt the media in the process, you're far ahead of the game. Yeah. And this is what it's all about, <coughs> keeping a blanket of silence over the majority. Because I can tell you, the majority of Americans actually have common sense. Yeah. Yeah, they do. But they're afraid to speak out because they will be targeted, they will be called names, they will be investigated by the IRS. Mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of unimaginable things will happen. I mean, I, you would be horrified if I told you all the things that have happened to me mm -hmm. and to my family and to associates and organizations that I'm associated with. But you know what? The reason that that doesn't frighten me is found in the book of Romans, you. chapter 8, it says, If God be for you, who can be against you? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 You know, there comes a time when people with values 
simply have to stand up. Mm -hmm. Think about Nazi Germany. Most of those people did not believe in what Hitler was doing. Yep. Exactly. But did they speak up? No. Nope. Did they stand up for what they believed? They did Very not. Few. And you saw what happened. And if you believe that the same thing can't happen again, you're very wrong. Yep. But we're not going to let it happen. No. Okay? No. okay, because at one of the things that I've found as I've traveled across this nation, and you know, September, October, and November, you know, my wife and I were in a different state virtually every day <laughs> with very large enthusiastic crowds, red states, blue states, north, south, east, west, it didn't matter. People were coming out and they were saying like, you mean, I'm not the only one with common sense? <laughs> I mean, there's somebody else who believes like, you mean I don't have to hide under this rock? And, and, and that's what we've got to do. We've got to get people to once again have the kind of courage that made this into such an incredible nation. And we can't listen to those people who are trying to divide us. You see, we the people are the strength of this nation. And in our unity, there is even greater strength. Those who are trying to fundamentally change the nation, they look for any possible crack into which to drive a wedge. And that's why you have the war on women, you have the war on wealth, you have racial wars, you have age war, every kind of war that you can come up with, this is what they are proposing because they want to keep us divided. I have a news flash. Because you disagree with somebody on an issue does not make them your enemy. Okay? This is what we have to understand. And in fact, I'm fond of saying if two people agree about everything, one of them isn't necessary. <laughs> and I think, I think everybody's necessary. And, and what's really more important is that people be able to discuss the things that they may vary on in terms of opinion. You can learn a lot more from somebody who disagrees with you than somebody who agrees with you yes. about everything. Oh, yeah. And having open discussions, we can all learn a lot more. And one of the things that we will learn is that the person that you disagree with on this issue is actually a pretty nice person and can be your friend. And that on the big issues, that we have agreement and we must learn to unite on the big issues. On the peripheral issues, leave them out. You know, that's not important. But you will find, particularly as we approach the 2014 elections and then later the 2016 elections, that the adversaries will try to do everything they can to pick up these little peripheral issues and blow them up and try to divide people. Don't let it happen. Don't let them demonize the Tea Party and yeah. other people. Yeah. I'll tell you that the Tea Party is no big complex organized system. The Tea Party are ordinary Americans from all backgrounds who say, <coughs> excuse me, uh -huh. uh, don't we have something to say about how our government is run? Yeah, right here. And uh, you know, <laughs> that's, it. That's, that's all they are. And that's who, you know, we just need to, to, to work together to make sure that those people who believe differently, and I'm not saying that they're bad people, but there's a group of people who believe that we should be government-centric nope. and not people-centric. And that was not the original intent of this nation. No, it wasn't. This was a great experiment to see if it would be possible for a country to remain focused on the rights of its people. Yes. And it had been something that was very, very difficult in the past. 
And that's the reason that our founders, they were very smart people, they were eclecticists. They looked at this government from the past and this one, and they picked out all the good things from amongst them, and they tried to put together something that would keep us focused. For instance, by putting together a divided government, yeah. separation of yep. powers. Now, in recent times, <laughs> a couple of the branches have forgotten <laughs> that they can oppose an imperial executive branch. But I think uh, they may be starting to wake up a little bit, you know, less. You know, last week when, when with this Little Sisters of Mercy, they... Yeah. Yes. You know, that was a good sign that maybe they're starting to wake up, and it was unanimous. Um, obviously, there's still more uh, deliberations that are going to have to go on there. We'll see what the final outcome is, but that, that gives me courage. But it doesn't make me complacent, because what I know from what I've been able to see recently, is that we must not only increase our numbers in the House, but we must take the Senate. Yes. Yes. Because Harry Reid is an obstructionist. Yes. Okay? And, uh, you know, they don't do logical things. Everything they do is done politically. Yeah. You know, this whole health care thing, it was done politically. It was a political thing. I talked to one of the high administration uh, officials just before the um, affordable health care. I don't like to call it affordable health care because, because it's not affordable. You know? um, I don't want to say what I really think about it. But at any rate, I said... You know, if you, I said, first of all, there are some things in here that are reasonable. You know, lifetime limits and pre-existing diseases. And I said, there are some things that are reasonable. And I think that, that if we discuss these things, there can be a coming together of the minds. And we can start small with things that we agree with and then build logically together since healthcare is something that affects everybody. Yep. And isn't this a republic type yes. of de a democracy yep. where there's representation of all the people yes. and not just a particular segment? And I said, if in fact you push this through on a one party basis, you will lose the house you may lose the Senate. You're going to create enormous chaos. You'll never get any cooperation. And uh, he said, you're probably right. But this is Washington, and this is politics. Well, you know, when you start taking things that are so important to all of us and putting them into the political arena, you have committed a moral transgression yeah. against what the United States stands for. That's right. And we simply cannot tolerate it any longer. And that's why it's important that every one of you, and you all have spheres of influence, you, have, you need to go to those people in your spheres of influence. Whether they agree with you or not, you have to start doing the very same things that people were doing in the pre-revolutionary days of this country. They were getting together with their friends and neighbors and they were discussing yep. what is going on in our country. Why are we slaving away to support the British who have no concern whatsoever about us other than milking us for our resources? Aren't we in the same situation today? Yeah. 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 You think there's care yeah. about it? Yeah. So. And that's why it's important to get together and to talk. Whether people disagree with you, whether they agree with you, talk. Talk about what do you want to leave for the next generation. What do you want for yourself? 
10 years from now, 20 years from now. Talk about what this nation is. Talk about the fact that in 1831, when Alexis de Tocqueville came here from France to study America because the Europeans were just so fascinated, they said, how can a nation barely 50 years old already be competing with us on virtually every level? That's impossible. Nothing like that has ever happened in the history of the world. And he was going to come over here. He was going to dissect everything. He was going to figure out what it was or what it wasn't. And he looked at our government. He was duly impressed with the efficiency of our government. Now, this was a long time ago. <laughs> And then he said, well, let me look at their educational system. And he was blown away. Anybody finishing the second grade was completely literate. They could read the newspaper. They could have a political discussion. They could tell them how the government worked. You only found that with the aristocracy in Europe. And when you stop and think about it, and you think about how rapidly this country expanded, a lot of it had to do with the fact that we had well-educated people. I mean, how in the world were those early settlers able to push across a rugged and hostile nation from one ocean to the other? It was because they knew how to build roads and structurally sound bridges and containment facilities and dams. They understood principles. They knew how to invent things when a problem came up. That's why that education is so valuable. And, you know, it's the reason that we were able to accelerate so quickly. I mean, you think about it. people who say that this is not an exceptional nation, you know, they need to go jump in the lake. Because, <laughs> you know, you think about the world 100 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, 5,000 years before the United States of America, people did things the same way. Nothing changed. Within 200 years of America coming on the scene, men were walking on the moon. <laughs> Think about that. I mean, this nation has really changed the course of mankind. And it's because of that innovative spirit and that hard work. You know, I was a visiting professor in Germany four years ago. And after one of my lectures, some of the German doctors came up to me and they said, that is good. No, that's not that. <laughs> now, what they said is, you know, it looks like you guys are moving toward our system of government oh. and more socialized type medicine. The great United States of America, which means we have the better system. And we should be gloating. But we're not gloating. We're actually not happy about it. Because if you become like us, who's going to be the innovators? Where's it going to come from? You see, the world recognizes who we are and what we've done. And you also have to think about this. Our position as the pinnacle nation in the world right now, very important to know what to do with that position, to know how to lead with the deposition. When the pinnacle nation does not lead, the rest of the world becomes like a classroom of rowdy kids with no teacher. Yeah. And all kinds of things begin to happen. And you know, if we relinquish our position as a pinnacle nation, guess what? Somebody else is going to take that position. And if you look back through the history of the world, before we assumed our position, there was a lot of carnage. And we are the most benign pinnacle nation that the world has ever known. It will not continue to be benign if we are not there. So I think what, what we're going to have to start thinking about is how do we solve these problems. And, you know, as Dr. Webby was saying, one of the reasons that I encourage physicians, 
scientists, engineers, people like that, to get involved in politics? It's because these are people who have been trained to make decisions based on evidence, not on ideology. Yes. Ideology is destroying our nation. We find people, when they are ideologues, they are completely incapable of seeing any other point of view. They're incapable of seeing blatant mistakes and things that are creating chaos. And, and, and the only response is, we need to do more. We didn't do enough. You know, that is like beyond belief stupid. And, uh, and, and that's why, you know, it's very difficult to reform people like that. And that's why you have to get rid of them. You yep. have to throw them out of office. Because they, they don't represent common sense. Yep. And common sense is who we are, is who we have always been, and it is one of the reasons that we were able to excel the way we did. You know, you look at things like our tax structure. Now, you think the Obamacare document is thick. <laughs> It is dwarfed by our tax code, which is absolutely absurd. No one in this room, no matter how honest they are, couldn't be gotten on some tax issue. That, to me, is the precursor of a totalitarian government. And that's why it is essential that we put into Congress people who don't simply talk about tax reform, but who actually will carry it out. Yeah. You know, the highest corporate tax rate in the world, think about the damage that something like that does. You know, our neighbors to the north, Canada, a few years ago, they recognized that. They slashed their corporate tax rates. And what happened? As Ross Perot would say, <laughs> big sucking sound. Right? <laughs> yeah. you know? I mean, if everybody else is smart enough to recognize that, why don't we recognize it? I'll tell you one reason. Ideology. We're ideologues. We can't learn because of that. So again, the solution is the same. You get rid of them. And then you think about, um, you know, the individual taxes. So you realize that right now the average American has to work from January 1st until sometime in April just to pay their taxes? Yeah. Does that make any sense? No. I mean, God. <laughs> God said that he only wanted ten percent. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, give me a break. I mean, I mean, I mean, I so, and and then we have you know people like our president saying. But we have to be fair. <laughs> now, I don't quite understand his definition of fairness if half the people don't pay any federal taxes, but they get to vote on how much the other half pays. Mm -hmm. How is that fair? Does that make any sense whatsoever? <laughs> so, having said that, I predict that in 2014, November, there's going to be a massive victory and a return to common sense. All right. It's going to be repeated in 2016. But here's what must be remembered. When we regain control, and when I say we, I'm not talking about Republicans or Democrats or Independents. I'm talking about we, the people, with common sense. Okay? When that happens, we have to remember that somebody at some point has to be the adult. And we can't say, we're treating them like they treated us, we're doing the, you know, you can't do that. 
we have to start thinking about what works for all the people. We have to reestablish a representative government where the people are at the pinnacle and where we are concerned about what's happening to them, we may even need another constitutional convention. Yeah. Because the, the fact of the matter is, there's so many things that are out of date. You know, when we decided that Supreme Court judges and federal judges should have lifetime appointments, the average age of death was 47. Yeah. Okay? So, you know, we, we need to relook at these things. Um, Term limits, absolutely crucial. The reason that they didn't build term limits into our system is because it was a sacrifice. You know, nobody was going to go there and want to stay for very long. You know, all right, it's my turn. I'll go for a little while. But uh, now it's turned into a gravy train. And uh, so, you know, we need to find a way to fix that. If, in fact, we have term limits, maybe just one term, we can lengthen that term, um, and you can recall people from it, but they cannot be reelected. then we get rid of the fourth branch of government, which is special interest. Yep. We need to be able to do that. So, and that way the system begins to work the way that it's supposed to work. And that's really all that we want. We want a system where every American has a fair opportunity. We do not want a government where the government picks and chooses the winners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where the government picks and chooses the laws that it wants to enforce. Where the government has its finger in every aspect of our lives. When we're talking about your health and health care, that is the most valuable thing that you have. You know, when I was an intern at Johns Hopkins and I would walk around those wards and I would see these very important people, CEOs of big corporations and presidents of organizations and crown princes and queens of nations dying of some horrible disease. Every single one of them would have gladly given every penny and every title for a clean bill of health. You begin to realize what your health means. And do you really want to turn that over to the government, to a bunch of bureaucrats? You know, think about it. And you know, every free society, go back and study free societies that have turned to communists or socialists. And you will see two major things occur. First of all, they have to get rid of God. Because they don't want somebody or some other system saying what is right and wrong. They want to be the ones that say what's right and wrong and make all the determination. And secondly, you take control of health care. Because you want the people to be dependent on you. So you're the authority and they're dependent on you. And we simply have to understand what is going on. It's subtle. The enemies of this nation realized that our military was too strong to overcome, although it is weakening by the day. But it would be much easier to have it destroyed from inside, to fundamentally change who we are. Now, I don't know, and I certainly don't believe that all of the people who espouse big government are part of some conspiracy. But I think some of them are. Yeah. I think some of them actually want to bring this country down. Yeah. And they hate the United States. Yeah. They think that you know we're evil, and they always bring up slavery, they bring up Vietnam, they bring up other kinds of things. Well, I will tell you, if you go back through the history of the world, you will see that there was never a perfect nation. And I think of all the nations, you know, we have a pretty good record. And have we made mistakes? Absolutely we made mistakes. But you learn from mistakes. That's the key. That's how you make progress. 
you know, why do they call cleaning formula 409 409? The first 408 didn't work. But, you know, you learn from those things and you move forward. That is the key to progress. And really, what is success? You know, is it a big house? Is it a lot of money? Fancy cars? Not really. I think it's taking the talent that God has given you and using that to elevate the people around you. Yeah. That's what motivates me. That's what motivates Monica. I mean, I want you to think about this. She's running for the United States Senate. Now, I can tell you, I'm not going to give you numbers, but a pediatric neurosurgeon makes a lot more money than the Senate. Okay. So, I mean, you have to really be thinking, I want to do something. I cannot just sit here and watch this happening. And what we all need to think about as I close, is what are we willing to fight for in order that those who follow us can enjoy what we have enjoyed? And I want you to think about the brave people who preceded us. I want you to think about George Washington's ragtag army who didn't even have boots and how they were able to defeat the most powerful empire on earth. I want you to also think about the fact that, you know, Obama liked to say they didn't do it by themselves. Well, in this case, they did. Because God is on their side. Yeah. You know, during the Battle of New York, Washington was down to his last battalion. They had wiped out all of her other trips, it looked like the end of the war. They were closing in. They had assembled the largest armada in the history of the world on the sea. And three Italians coming in from land, they were surrounded. It looked like doomsday. Meteorological records document well that that night a mysterious fog <laughs> fell on that area. And it remained after the sun rose and allowed Washington's troops to escape. To try to tell me that that was a coincidence, <laughs> that strains the limits of credulity. And there are many other instances like that. And that's why during the last Constitutional Convention, when the whole thing was about to fall apart because people couldn't agree, Small states, large states, just couldn't agree. And the elder statesman, Benjamin Franklin, 81 years old, stood up there and he said, gentlemen, stop. He said, during the Revolutionary War, every elder sentence out of your mouth was, Lord, save us, and now you don't want to talk to God. And he said, let us get down on our knees and let us seek wisdom from God. And that whole assembly knelt down and they prayed and they asked for wisdom. And when they got up, they put together a 16 and one-third page document known as the Constitution of the United States of America, one of the most admired documents in the world, and a document that if we were to revere it today, would bring us out of the doldrums. Because we're just afraid to do that. Think about people like Patrick Henry, who said, give me liberty or give me death. Nathan Hill, a teenage rebel and a spy for us, about to be executed by the British. He said, my only regret is that I have but one life to give for my country. Think about all of those soldiers during World War II, storming the shores of Normandy, being mowed down with machine gun fire by the enemies. Did they turn back? No. 
they stepped over the bodies of their slain comrades and they continued up the hill and they overwhelmed the enemy and they did that for us so that we could have a land that was free. Think about our soldiers all around the world today. Think about those about those Navy SEALs at Benghazi who against orders went to that compound and fought so hard they got a lot of those people out and they were absolutely certain that we had their back and that help was coming and little could they have known that they had been written off, that we weren't coming to help them. It, is that the America that we grew up in? Is that the America that we know? That is not the America that we want to pass on to our kids. But it's going to require courage from all of us. And when you sing the last stanza of our national anthem, and it says, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Don't just let that roll off your tongue. But think about the fact that we cannot be free unless we are brave. Thank you, and vote for Monica.